morning folks, it's Nito with Archer's Paradox 2020 Outdoors Adventures. I'm at the 2016 National Rifle Association Annual Meetings and Exhibits. I'm honored to have Bob Hodgson with Hodgson Powder here as my guest. Bob, how you doing? It's good to see you again. Awesome, thank you Bob. So Bob, tell me a little bit about the history of Hodgson Powder. Okay, um, how long of a session do you want? Oh, and we can, what, you know, make five, six minutes, okay. that's fine. Um, basically, uh, my dad uh, was a hunter and a reloader before World War II, and during the war he loaded ammunition for his friends. Um, he was uh, taken into the Navy and uh, made a uh, gunnery instructor, and that meant uh, aerial gunnery instructor for the naval uh, pilots. And uh, the first thing that they do to learn shooting is to get on the skeet field to learn to lead and so forth. And so he was an instructor there. And uh, his commanding officer, I don't know if you would know, uh, Robert Stack. Yes. Uh -huh. that was he, he was an actor. Yes. Yes. And also a skeet champion. And a skeet champion, too. Yes. yes. Uh, right before the war. Right. Anyway, um, and uh, while he was in the Navy, he read about the fact that after World War I, there were tremendous shiploads of gunpowder. Uh, that were surplus, they were dumped into the ocean because there was no market for it. And uh, at that time, the powder wasn't as stable as, as the World War II stuff, and it, it would uh, tend to deteriorate, and uh, if it was improperly stored, you'd have a fire. So, but he knew that uh, there'd probably be millions of pounds of powder uh, available, um, and uh, after World War II, so in 1947, he was able to get himself on the bidder's list, government bidder's list, and uh, was successful in buying 50,000 pounds of 4895 rifle powder uh, made by DuPont. Um, and he was able to, only able to borrow against his life insurance to do that. We have a note in the office where he borrowed $1,500 1947 money, and this was in November of 1947. Um, he made a payment of $400 on it in December, and he paid it off in February. And uh, the uh, he knew that the 4895 was used in 306, so he figured that there were several calibers, uh, uh, sporting calibers, that it would be useful for. Right. And um, uh, we, he, he uh, we got a chronograph that was an old machine that, with, that just simply counted time. Right. And uh, with printed circuits, silver printed circuits that uh, were placed 10 feet apart in the little building that he called the laboratory. Right. And uh, uh, tested. Uh, starting off, we had no way to test pressure, but we did test uh, velocities and uh, he uh, and the old typewriter typed up uh, the data that he had produced, and we had a mimeograph machine that my brother and I got to turn the crank on, uh, and uh, we uh, plastic bound a little uh, booklet that we sent out to anyone who was interested in, in buying the powder. And uh, he always felt that the only way that you're going to convince people to uh, load with your product is to give them good information, accurate information on, on what it, the performance of it will be. So that's what, uh, that's, we've done that since the very first. Um, and uh, he ran an ad in the American Rifleman. NRA publication. NRA publication. Right. Uh, just a little classified ad, more or less, gunpowder, B.E. Hodgson, in Miriam, Kansas. And like I say, he was successful enough to pay his loan off immediately and almost immediately and uh, and then uh, uh, sold both uh, I think started with one pound paper bags that my brother and I helped him package package in the basement of our house really uh -huh. and, <clears throat> and uh, then a little later on when the business really started uh, being something, uh, we would, my brother and I going to high school, would 
to work in the evenings, packaging the powder, throw the boxes in the trunk of my dad's 1940 Ford, and uh, on the way to high school, we would stop by the local railway express agency, which was the only way to ship explosives at the time. All right. Uh, and uh, in, in small packages um, for a reasonable amount of money. Of course, the, the drawback was that the customer had to go to a, a railroad terminal somewhere to get their powder. Get their powder. How much was powder a pound back then? Um, I think we sold, my dad sold it. 20 pound keg of 4831 and uh, 5,000 primers. He'd made a really good buy on a lot of primers for $20.95. <laughs> <laughs> Not today's prices, I promise. Not you. today's prices. Yeah, yeah. But he, we also sold uh, 50 pound kegs, 100 pound kegs, and the powder came to us originally in copper lined wooden kegs. The, uh, the keg weighed about 49 pounds and had 150 pounds of powder. And uh, when we started, my brother was, uh, I'm going to say 12, and I was probably 10. And so we grew up manhandling. Those so kegs. you didn't go to the gym to work out. Didn't you already had your way to work that's out. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, interesting. So, so as a, a hunter, shooter, and reloader as myself, we'll fast forward a little bit. What? So forty eight ninety five, forty eight thirty one. Those were the first two. First two. Obviously, thirty oh six, thirty out six. When did you start realizing that you had it? Because what were the mainstream smaller cartridges back then? The triple dues for the bench rest shooters, probably in the two twenty two. Yes. And, uh -huh. and, and what and would they load back then? Well, the forty ninety five would work. The forty ninety five. Forty eight ninety five. Forty eight ninety five would work. It was fast enough. Yes. For the smaller yes. pace. Yes, it, it worked fine. Right. Uh, I'm not saying maximize performance compared right. to what we could do today. Oh, yeah, yeah. But it worked right. and uh, was, was very popular. And uh, then uh, the 30 carbine, we were able to buy uh, wow, thousands of pounds of what we sold as H240. 2400 was, it was a Hercules powder made by the government. It was right. close to uh, what they sell even today is 2400. That's a ball powder. Uh, no, spherical. It's a, it's a flake powder. Oh, it's a flake powder. I'm flake sorry. Yeah, double, it's not a spherical. Double base flake powder. Double base, right. Uh, right. And um, so uh, we sold that for pistol powder. Right. It was, it was uh, uh, called it H240. Um, and uh, it became very popular for 38 Special 357 mag and uh, was usable in really good for 44 mag when it came out. Right, Elmer Keith. There you go. Shot that with his Keith, his 240 grain semi wide right. cutter that Elmer well, Keith he designed. designed. He yeah. designed, right, uh -huh. right, right. That's interesting. So, Bob, tell me about back then. What year was this? Uh, well, we, we got the uh, Hercules powder, I'm going to say in 1950. 1947 started the 4095. Right. 4831 was the next. Uh, and interesting, I'll just have to tell a little side story. Go ahead, on that. go ahead, go ahead. And that is uh, that at one time we were, there were 12 million pounds of 4831 on one government bid. Wow. And it was in Hastings, Nebraska. And my dad bid on that. He knew he couldn't handle it. But he, we received, I don't, I don't know for sure how much, it was over a million pounds of power, and had it trucked to our, uh, our first magazine was a, a boxcar in the middle of the field, two boxcars in the middle of the field. Um, <clears throat> but at, uh, he paid, I think, six-tenths of a cent a pound for over 12 million pounds of power. Yeah, that adds up to six-tenths of a cent yes, times 12 does. million. It does. <laughs> uh, but uh, the... The uh, kegs we emptied and sold the powder, and then for probably months the empty kegs just were discarded, just sat around. And we decided that they had a, the copper had a value. We were able to scrap the take the wood off the copper liners, scrap the copper, and we got considerably more money for the copper out of the keg than we paid for the powder in the keg. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was a blessing. That was a blessing. That was a true blessing. That, that's there. a good markup. Right, right. Who, who realized that the copper was was ha, had value? 
Who was that? Oh, that was my dad's. He, Your dad. He saved everything. We, he right. never threw anything away. Hey, my father was the same way. Yeah, yeah. That's Very resourceful. From the Depression. From That's, the Depression, right. Yes, sir. Right, absolutely. Absolutely. So, now there's what? How many documented powders are there? Oh, gosh. Over I think 100. we have a, a burning rate. I think we have 58 or 59. Yes. And but there's more than that. Oh, yes. Right, our right. Oh, that does not include the Vitivori powder. Yeah, Vitivori, so. right, right. <clears throat> but in the Hodgkin line, uh, IMR line, Winchester line, um, and, uh, and sort of the smokeless line. Right. Right, right at 60. 60. And, of course, in the... Uh, we, we also uh, manufacture and sell Gorex black powder. Right. And uh, the uh, the other muzzling powders that we manufacture, Firedex, Triple Seven, uh, and uh, the uh, pellets. The uh, pellets of each of those and the white hot. Pellets. The white hot. Right. 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 So it's interesting how you know it, it, a lot in the in the hunting industry. You know where you know you grew up hunting with what caliber rifle? Oh gosh, I had a 22 250. Okay, which was kind of revolution. Was that a Wildcat still at the time? It was a Wildcat. And what at the Remington time. still did not no, commercial? No, they didn't commercialize yeah. it, I don't know, until maybe 1960 or. Right, later. right. And of course, as a kid, I I had to have a, a good barman rifle. Right oh, yeah, yeah, and that and, was a hot rod. And I had a 222. Right. And uh, I had a, a, a Colt in 1960, I bought a Colt. Python, four inch, it was, still remains one of my favorite pistols. All right. I think I paid $95. <laughs> You've seen what they're going for these yes, days. Sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I won't sell mine. No, no, no. So, so, so I guess what I was driving at was, <coughs> there's a finite number of cartridges, right? Yes. And then, obviously, have, have we reached the point of diminishing returns as far as the amount of powder is necessary? Uh, that's good. A good point. You know what I'm saying? Today? today. Oh, uh, I mean, 58, 60 powders should cover the spectrum well, from slowest to highest. And you know, we feel like fastest. we have done a good job of filling niches. Right. Of demand for something special. Then, then something happens like the 300 blackout. Right. That was one of my questions coming. Requires, you must have been reading my mind. Requires, uh, which we will have a powder next year for that. Awesome. Thank uh, you. Specifically for that, it'll be good for other light load uh, applications. Right. Right. Because I'm currently I drop in my 300 blackout low gun and H110. Uh -huh. But as you know, if you you know you follow the market, we need as 300 blackout shooters for the subsonics. Yes. We need a subsonic. Load you do. That, and, that will cycle the action. And uh, there's a couple of, of uh, new powders out there for that purpose. I think ours will be the best. Awesome, awesome. You know, it was just by accident um, last. Last year, I started shooting the 4570, oh. and Chris sent me a couple pounds of the of the uh, IMR 4198, uh -huh. and just by accident, that's what I've been shooting in my 300 oh, really? blackout. Uh -huh. It's extruded. That's interesting. But sure. I, I'm, I'm getting good. It, it cycles. Uh -huh. Subsonic. Uh -huh. I shoot 175 grain barns, and I'm dropping nine grains of IMR 4198. Cycles my wow. rifle pistol length. Gas system, uh -huh. right? so, so, you know, uh -huh. cycles fine. But I'm very excited about the new powder coming out. That's good to hear. It's good to hear. So, anything else you want to talk about, Bob? There's a what? What? In your estimation, your father had. He must have prophesized that, you know, because I've been a reloader since 1988, uh -huh. and I've dropped over 20,000 centerfire pistol at least five or six thousand center fire and just for a small time shooter uh -huh. yeah i'm a small time that's shooter a that's, a that's still shooting. a lot yeah. you know sure but but going back to your father's you know time you know because before that it was all commercial well you know, boy he must have had a foresight and you've seen the industry grow well, he, he was uh, it was his hobby right and he loved it and right. he had lots of friends who also who shot it. right yeah. and shot right and uh and uh one thing that added to the popularity of reloading was a group of ma uh, company owners, uh, Fred Huntington, RCBS, Ray Spear, Spear, and CCI, um, Joyce Warner Day, um, who else? Uh, oh, the Noslers. Right. Um, 
Bob. Hey, Bob Nosler. Right. Well, actually, it was his dad, his dad John. John, right, I'm sorry. Time. Right, the time. Uh, you got to go, go back a generation. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> uh, they decided that the way to, uh, they got together uh, with a little association, the National Reloading Manufacturing Association, <clears throat> that the way to popularize reloading was to do a road show. Right. And they, um, uh, and there were several others, uh, uh, the, the Alcan company, uh, guys that made wads, and, and they had uh, some imported powders. Uh, who else? Mac. Uh, right, MEC. Uh, did the shotgun reloaders. Ted Bachhuber, I think it was, who uh, was the first uh, Mac uh, instrumental person. Anyhow, uh, probably a dozen uh, people who knew their stuff. Right. Who knew their products and knew what the market want, was, but they went. They they banded together, and they uh, traveled the country, uh, putting on a, a seminar of an evening. They would uh, team up with local dealers, who would publicize ahead of time, and they would. Uh, and sometimes you get as many as two hundred fifty or three hundred people in a room half the size of this. Right. And uh, of interest and and. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the local leader better stock up because. Oh yeah, you got to pique that, these guys' interest. That, they right. want to reload. They want to do it. Right. And it was uh, eminently successful. <clears throat> At the same time, there was a big problem in um, uh, shipping uh, powder. Right. And uh, the REA was slowly going out of business, and so the powder had to be. What was done was that my dad and several and Ray Spear was one with his the uh, Frank Church the uh, senator from Idaho uh, was instrumental in uh, uh, going to uh, Congress and and they um, worked with the DOT to uh, downgrade small packages of powder okay to be able to be shipped the Ship. same as ammunition or well, right. almost the same as ammunition right not not the class a explosive that the truck lines had right called it before which was which obviously drove costs prohibitively then, oh yeah to the market yes you know guys not going to pay that much for shipping exactly more than the product itself and uh, and so that that was a also a striking thing that happened right it made reloading more uh viable to everybody to everybody everybody yeah I'll tell you what, Bob, I want to thank you as a shooter and sure. a hunter and as a reloader. Um, you know, I, when, when I started shooting as an engineer, I always liked to, to dive into why, asking why as an engineer, sure, sure, as sure. yourself, uh -huh. you know, and why can I, why can't I do it better? And I've been uh, a fan of hydrogen powder and oh, then IMR great. for all these years. And thank you. I really appreciate you and, and your son, Chris. And many more days of getting in my basement you know as you know reloading is very therapeutic uh-huh you, you can relax because you're concentrating on oh, you're that. focused on, on one and then not just therapeutic but the excitement uh-huh the fun the of, fun of, of, of your developing your load uh -huh. it's a custom load you know sure. so that adds a whole dimension to the sport oh yeah and, and, and the, the other things people ask me that want to get in reloading I tell them, I said, now I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you the truth, okay. The old wise tell is that, oh, reloading is, it'll be cheaper than shooting. Well, the truth is yeah. that <laughs> it's not. Take it from somebody that's been reloading for 26 years, okay. It's not cheaper, but I tell you what, you could shoot a lot more. The only thing is it's cheaper per round. Cheaper per <laughs> round. <laughs> then, right. Right. then you're more like, a lot more likely to shoot anyway for lots of other Oh, for other reasons. reasons. Yeah, because, you know, now you're not... You know, every time, you, now you know the price of ammunition. Oh, yeah. It's like, you know, guys pulling the trigger, it's like one dollar, you know? <laughs> that, that's the thing, especially in recent years, is all the emphasis on uh, defense weapons. And right. The, the black guns and oh, yeah. semi-automatic and the guys that have been uh, overseas and have, uh, have gotten used to those weapons of, right. of choice, and that's right. what they want to shoot. Mm -hmm. Right. Instead of going out to a range like we used to go out and maybe shoot a box of shells right. or a bolt-action rifle. Right. Now we go through hundreds. Hundreds. Oh yeah. And yeah. yeah, that adds up. That's good for the hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> what's your What's your take? One last question, Bob. What's your take on 
you know, as you know, you know this intimately, the, the powder, primer, bullet, ammunition shortage. How, yes. how are you all dealing with <clears throat> Pretty caught up, or you're, um, you're still that's seeing a some. Really good question. Yeah, and uh, it's a little bit mixed. Right. Um, we, I tell people, uh, it's politically motivated, of course, and fear that people think right. they'll be unable to keep their guns, be unable to to uh, pursue their sports, uh, reload ammunition, whatever. And when the president we have now came into office in. In 2008, our com company had been, we were 63 years old, right. doing X amount of business in Smokers. And uh, in 2015, 2014 and 15, we were doing 3X, and yeah, uh, which is tremendous. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you, you could have never wildly predicted no, three times. No. And you can't, you can't tool capital, you can't. You can't predict that. The only blessing to us was that in 2005, we had moved our magazine facility and the packaging facility from Kansas City to the plant in Harrington, Kansas, 25 hours west of where we are. And uh, we increased our capacity, automated, and right. increased our capacity about two and a half times. If we hadn't done that, we still don't be, know how we could have tried to keep still up. Still would catch it. Right. Okay. But, but the, to answer your question better, um, the most of all this it was not from a lack of supply. As I say, we sold three times the product we were, right. and I'm sure our competitors are the same. <clears throat> but um, it was a demand problem, right? And uh, that demand is somewhat satiated, depending on on which product and, and uh, our rifle powders we did. A better job of catching up on over the last couple of years than pistol and shotgun. That's changing, uh, and uh, I think that most products should be available at the store for uh, your regular source of supply um, and much better uh, percentage of, of uh, demand right. than uh, in the past. So this year will be the the catch up here, in, unless the election goes ignites it again. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Bob, thank you. So much.